Sir, your bath is ready. Oh, hello. Today we're talking about the history of bathing on ships. Obviously I'm not doing this right, but let's go back in history and see how they did it in the old days. I'm Chris Frame and I write maritime history books and lecture on board cruise ships about maritime history and the cruising industry. I also make YouTube videos about cruising and maritime history. If that sounds like the sort of thing you're interested in, please hit that subscribe button. When the first transatlantic steamships started plying the oceans in the 1830s, regular bathing wasn't really a thing. The rich might have had more access to bathing and thus would have been cleaner, but for most people, bathing on a regular basis wasn't something that they did. And people used to wear perfume in self-defense. Yes, self-defense. You wore perfume so that you couldn't smell other people. And regular teeth brushing also wasn't a thing. I can just leave you to imagine how gross that must have smelt and tasted and felt. Cunard's first purpose-built ship, Britannia, entered service in 1840, and there was no running water on board. In the cabins you would find wash bowls, water jugs and chamber pots, and you'd have been given an allocation of water. There was no desalination plants on board, so you couldn't just turn on the tap. This might have sounded a little bit unsanitary, but it wasn't a vast departure from what people were experiencing at home. In fact, unless you were quite wealthy, you didn't have access to regular bathing facilities, and so on board Britannia it was a bit like life as normal. There was, however, on board the ship some communal toilets that could be accessed during the day, but at night time you were limited to using your chamber pot only, particularly after midnight when it was a strict lights out policy on board the ship. But as attitudes started to change towards bathing, so did standards both on land and on ships. And in fact the Hindostan, a P&O liner from 1843, even had some private facilities in a few of the first class cabins. Everyone else had to still go down the hall. By the turn of the 20th century, attitudes towards bathing had changed, particularly amongst the upper classes and those people who could afford indoor plumbing. On board ships of this era, you also started to see changes taking place, and I thought I'd focus on one of the most famous ships that everyone knows of, that is the RMS Titanic. Titanic was the second in the Olympic class of liners built by the White Star Line, and they were designed to be ultra luxurious, particularly in first class. But just because it was a luxurious ship didn't mean you had access to a private bathroom. In fact, on Titanic, only a few first class cabins had their own ensuite. Everybody else in first class had access to a bathroom. However, these were communal bathrooms that, while private whilst you were using them, were not attached to the cabin and were accessed by multiple passengers. And bathing was a little bit different to what it is now as well, because on board the Titanic and her sister ship, the Olympic, you had access to seawater only. It did come in hot and cold, but it wasn't the fresh water that we expect in a bath today. By this stage, there was a class system on board the ships, first, second, and steerage. In second class, on board the Olympic and the Titanic, you had access to baths, but none of the cabins had ensuite, and there were far fewer bath rooms per passenger than what you would find in first class. But moving down to third class or steerage is a completely different situation. While there were a couple of baths available, there's no way that the hundreds of passengers in this class would have got access to the bath. This wouldn't have been a surprise though, because most of the people traveling in third class probably wouldn't have been accustomed to having a full body submersion wash on a regular basis. One thing I should mention is on the Titanic and the Olympic, there were other bathing facilities aboard for the crew, including the very famous ensuite bathtub in Captain Smith's cabin, but there were also bathing facilities available for the other crew members to keep the crew clean for their service with the passengers. When they proposed to build Titanic 2, a replica of the famous White Star Liner, the idea was to replicate the original facilities on board, including the communal bathrooms. Would you sail on board a ship that didn't have private facilities? Let me know what you think in the comments below. If we skip forward a little bit and think of the golden age of transatlantic travel, particularly in the pre-World War II era when Queen Mary and Normandy were ruling the North Atlantic, this is an era that is romanticized as being luxurious and the epitome of transatlantic travel. But even on a ship like Queen Mary, which was the flagship of Cunard White Star and considered the ultimate ship from British engineering point of view, in first class, not all cabins had private bathrooms. In fact, it was still in the minority. For most people, they needed to make a booking with the bath steward to access the bath rooms on board the ship. At your allocated time, the bath steward would come to your cabin, knock on the door, and you'd be escorted to the bathroom, which had been prepared for you and to enjoy for an allocated period of time. After your bath was completed, you'd return to your cabin and the bath steward would prepare the room for the next passenger booking. On board Queen Mary, water was available in both salt and fresh water, both hot and cold. And on board the ship, there were more baths available for passengers in second class and in tourist class. 
Throughout the 1950s and 1960s, ensuite bathrooms became more common in selected first class cabins, but even throughout the 1960s as they were designing and developing ships, they included communal bathrooms. On board the P&O Canberra for example, which remained in service until 1997, there were shared bathrooms for many of the passengers on board the ship. Additionally, when QE2 was being developed, particularly in the early days when they thought she might be a three-class ship, they actually designed her with communal bathrooms on board. These spaces on board the ship were actually included in the final design, but converted into storerooms. And when you entered into these rooms, some of them were finished with the tiling up the walls as they would have had if they were bathrooms. As it turned out, Cunard included a private ensuite in all of the passenger cabins, one of the things that allowed QE2 to remain in service for almost 40 years. Today we're kind of obsessed with bathing and cleanliness, and that's not just because of COVID. You only need to go online or switch on the television to be bombarded with ads from shampoos and conditioners, hand soaps and deodorants that will have you believe that if you spray on some of this stuff you'll have hordes of attractive people chasing you down the streets. Today all cabins have access to a bathroom, regardless of the cabin category on board. Though baths are still reserved for the highest quality of accommodation on board most cruise ships. Actually whilst I've got you here, let me know in the comments below, do you hate a shower curtain on a ship? because I really do. Especially when the ship's moving in rough seas, it's just an unpleasant experience. But let me know what you think, shower curtain or shower door. Interestingly enough, even though private facilities became a major part of the cruise industry from the 1980s onwards, many of the cruise ships that were designed with communal bathrooms lasted until the 1990s. As I mentioned before, Canberra lasted until 1997, and in Australia, a very well-known and popular cruise ship, the Fair Star, also had communal bathrooms and she lasted as well until 1997. I think today if you boarded a cruise ship and found that there wasn't an ensuite bathroom on board, you'd be pretty surprised and really disappointed. But at the same time, you have to remember that the standards of living have changed compared to those ships of old. When the ocean liner was first starting to develop on the North Atlantic, many people weren't used to having access to running water or bathing on a daily basis. And therefore, the experience on board the ship was kind of accustomed to what they were used to at home. Just like our experience on board cruise ships today, demand that we have access to private facilities because that's what we're used to in our homes. I hope you've enjoyed this little look back in history at the bathing facilities on board the ships. Was there anything here that you were surprised about? Let me know in the comments below. If you're interested in more maritime history, please check out my maritime history playlist. Thanks so much for watching and until next time, I hope to see you on board. Today we're kind of obsessed with COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Smelt and tasted and felt. When the first transatlantic liner started plying the world's ocean, no, not the world's ocean, there's only one ocean, it's the transatlantic. Fast departure from what people are Hmm? Oh! <laughs> Hi, I'm Chris Raymond, welcome back to my channel.